In the last video, I looked at the various computing protocols for distributed login, more commonly known as single sign-in or single sign-on. And I ended up by mentioning that OAuth 2 is not an authentication protocol, but is for authorization, even though it is often used and misused for authentication. OpenID Connect corrects this without rewriting everything by sitting on top of OAuth 2. This means that an identity provider can support both pure OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect, and the client should use OpenID Connect for authentication if they can, but if for some reason they can't, they can still misuse OAuth 2 for authentication, but with an easy upgrade path when those changes can be made. So we need to understand the basics of OAuth 2 before we can understand how these are changed or extended by OpenID Connect. And the first question is, what problem does OAuth 2 solve? Well, it was designed so that a system can call an API on behalf of a user, either right away or over a period of time. Obviously, at the end stage, when you're actually asking for the, the data from the API, a code is provided that proves that you have permission. But how do we actually obtain that permission? Well, there are a few requirements to obtain that permission in the, this use case. The first is perhaps obviously there needs to be some kind of user interaction because the user needs to be able to give permission. Secondly, certainly ideally, we would like to authenticate the relying party, that is the application that you are trying to use, the application that's trying to access the API, that needs to authenticate to the identity provider. And it does that so that the identity provider knows that it is safe to provide that information to the relying party. If the relying party didn't authenticate, then it would be a danger that you're exposing private data to an untrusted entity. Another requirement is that API access might happen multiple times, either over a short period of time or even perhaps over days and weeks. So the protocol needs to allow multiple access. A security issue is we also need to somehow balance the fact that a system, the relying party, wants to gain lots of access to these APIs over perhaps a long period of time. But by giving them long life tokens, the danger is then we lose control um, over those tokens, over the access, or certainly we lose a certain amount of control. And then if we want to revoke those permissions, the only thing we can do is we can completely block the client from accessing the API again, which is quite a big deal. So we don't really want really long lifetimes, but at the same time, if you have really short lifetimes, then the danger is you've got a different sort of inconvenience where you have the security, but it now means that the relying party needs to keep asking for permission from the user in order to access the API. So one of the requirements with OAuth 2 was to come up with some kind of system that balances those two extremes. The other requirement of OAuth 2 specifically over version 1 was that by requiring HTTPS on the identity provider at a minimum, then we remove the need for digital signatures and that means we end up with a protocol that's easy to implement and test and therefore is likely to be taken up by developers. So these are really the five requirements for our protocol that's going to allow us to um, give this authorization to access the API. So we um, have a number of uh, different grants which are defined in the uh, OAuth 2 specification. In other words, how to actually grant access to this API. Now, a couple of these, there's one called the Resource Owner Password Grant, and there's one called the Client Credentials Grant. They would only be used rarely, and I'm not going to talk about them because uh, they're, they're just not used very often. They're for very specific cases. And also the specification talks about extension grants. In other words, if you want to wire your own one up, you can do that as well. But in my opinion, that just makes for too open-ended a, a spec. And that means it's quite hard to then try and standardize things when the specification gives so much scope to change it. So I'm not going to talk about customized grants either. But the two that are certainly the most important and by far the most common are 
are called the authorization code grant and the implicit grant. So we're going to look at the, the sequence of events that happens in OAuth 2 initially for the authorization code grant. So the first stage is that usually the user will instigate some kind of uh, instruction to the relying party saying that you need to do something which requires my data to come back from the resource provider. Now, although this isn't strictly required to be um, instigated by the user, clearly if the relying party needs permission from the user, then the user needs to be present. So in most cases, step one is initiated directly by the user. Step two is then the relying party saying, well, okay, I want your data, so I'm gonna have to go to the identity provider and this actually happens in a browser redirect and the identity provider, which is usually the same organization as the resource provider, but not necessarily, will then ask the user directly for permission for the relying party to access their data. Now, this is done in a redirect. So this is all kind of public information at this point in time. The identity provider then shows a browser page the user can see the URL, they can see an SSL certificate, whatever it might be. So they kind of go, yeah, I trust the identity provider and I'm happy to release my details to the relying party because I was the one who started the request in the first place. So we're all good so far. We now get to step four. So we've had um, requirement one, which is the user interaction. And requirement two was for the relying party to authenticate um, to the identity provider. Now, because this step four is a browser redirect again, this time back to the relying party, we can't pass any secret information in the URL. And as you probably know, authentication tends to be based on some kind of secret. And if it's a secret and it's in the URL, it stops being secret and it stops being valuable for authentication. So at this stage, we've got a couple of issues. The first is that the identity provider is not necessarily comfortable at this stage, giving any data back to the relying party because it doesn't necessarily know who the relying party is. And it can't ask the relying party to send the password in the URL in the first redirect because it would be secret. So what happens at this stage is that an authorization code is passed back to the relying party. So no information has changed hands at the minute. All that's happened is the identity provider is, is saying, okay, the user has given you permission, but you still don't know who the user is, but here's a code that identifies the fact that they have given permission. And that's all that gets passed back at this stage. So then the relying party then has to authenticate to the identity provider and says, okay, well, I've got this code. And as well as a code, I'm now going to prove who I am by saying that this is my client ID X, Y, Z. And the secret, my password is one, two, three, whatever it is. Usually those are generated by the identity provider. So they're obviously going to be um, more, more, more difficult than that. So this authentication is taking place on another channel. So in most cases, this would be the server um, talking to the identity provider in the background. So step six then says, OK, I verified your authentication. I now am happy that you are definitely the relying party that I think you are. So you've got details that match your registration. And so at this stage, we can now give um, a token back to the relying party. Now, you, you might think, well, at this stage, why don't we just give the, the data back, the user data? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, the resource provider and the identity provider are not always the same place or not always the same system. So the identity provider might not have any access to the resources being requested. But the second thing is, if I send the, the data back now in the response, how does the relying party query that information again? They can't query that information unless they have some kind of key, which is this access token, which they get given. And once they've got the access token, they can then basically go to the resource provider directly and say, well, I want this data and all I have is a token now. I don't need to do any usernames or passwords or permissions or anything like that. I've got a token. Give me the details for 
this user, whatever those details happen to be. And then obviously the resource provider is going to go, there you go. Uh, one of the issues at this stage that we'll see a couple of times um, over the next few slides is the data coming back from this call here in number eight is undefined in the spec. So it's likely to be in JSON format, but that's not guaranteed. You have to know what format that data is going to come back in. So that's one of the biggest weaknesses of the OAuth2 specification. Because that data isn't specified, which is deliberate because clearly the data coming back from Google is going to be different than Facebook. It's going to be different than Twitter. But it's also very unhelpful because when you're trying to write a standard plugin for OAuth2, there's no such thing because everybody's done it slightly differently. Even the field names for somebody's surname or last name or you know family name, whatever they call it, are all going to be different things. So what that means is most plugins are going to have one code file per provider to translate all of these different return um, data packets into something that that site can use. So the second important grant is the implicit grant. So the one we just saw previously, the authorization code grant, is the most secure because it authenticates the relying party to the authorization server the one we call here the identity provider, but it isn't possible to do that if you're calling for resources from something like JavaScript. Because if you were using JavaScript, the secret that you would need to authenticate with would be in the source code for the page, and by definition, it wouldn't be secure. So in this case, the implicit grant is used, which bypasses that step where you authenticate the relying party to the identity provider. So remember the requirement was that ideally the relying party authenticates, but if it can't, which it can't do in this case, then we miss out that step completely. So this kind of looks similar in the first step, get my data, ask user for permission, I'm happy to release details. The difference now is that a token is passed back immediately to the relying party, not a code. So they've got an access token directly. They've missed out the second step. And with that access token, they can go directly to the resource provider and they can get the details for the user. Now, you might kind of think, well, if that's the way it is, then surely I need to have that extra step in there. Surely if authentication is important, I can't just get rid of it. And that's kind of true. So the implicit grant is less secure than the authorization code grant. And so there are security implications. So for instance, you might decide as an identity provider that if somebody's using the implicit grant, that you will give them an access token, but maybe it will only um, be valid for a short period of time. Or maybe if you support refresh tokens, you won't give a refresh token in the implicit grant, but you will give one in the authorization code grant. So for a simple scenario, the implicit grant might be OK and it might be secure enough, but you have to weigh up the pros and cons, both as a relying party and also an identity provider in the risks that you might bring in if you miss out that additional step. So I mentioned these just now, refresh tokens. The balance that we were talking about between security and convenience also applies in OAuth 2, as it does in many, many things. As we said before, if I give a long life token to a relying party, then I kind of lose control over the access that that relying party has. But if I make the time too short, then the relying party has got to keep getting the user's permission. And that's both inconvenient for the relying party and potentially inconvenient for the user as well. So the inventors of OAuth2 had this idea of a refresh token, which allows the access token itself to be short lived. And so the resource server wouldn't have to keep checking whether, um, you know, the codes are valid. So it can just have a simple access token with an expiry and that's all it needs to know about. But it also avoids the user having to log in frequently. The relying party simply requests another token without the user's interaction using this refresh token. So if anything's changed, either by the user saying, I don't trust this guy anymore, or if the um, identity provider has changed its own security policies, the refresh mechanism allows all of those things to be taken into account. So it can reissue a new access token, perhaps with um, shorter expiry time, maybe an access token with less scope than the previous one, 
because it's being asked for automatically. So you've just got all of that extra control and it kind of works like this. So the first few steps have already taken place. The user is asked to log in, the relying party is redirected. And at this point, the user is happy. And um, this for the implicit grant is the first step. Whereas for the authorization code grant, this would be the second um, call to the web service. But at whatever point the access token comes back, with a refresh token, you get two tokens. You get the normal access token and you get a refresh token, which you store for later. So the access token is used as normal. The relying party goes to resource, says, can I have some details? And that says, yeah, sure. But then let's say a week later, the relying party comes back and says, I want, I want the same details again for this same token. Well, at this stage, the resource provider might say your access token has expired. Now, because the access token is ex has expired, it's kind of worthless. But because the refresh token has not expired, then the relying party can say, well, can I have new tokens, please? And it can pass a refresh token. Obviously, the identity provider is going to validate all of that information, but it can now reissue another token and another refresh token based on the latest policy or the new policy or whatever policy it's decided on as if this was a completely new uh, request. But because it's a refresh token, it happens invisibly to the user, which makes it much more convenient and still gives a certain amount of security. So, OK, what are the problems then? So OAuth 2 is fairly straightforward in its normal form. Remember, it was designed for authorization. So it's not a problem that there are authentication problems because that's not what it's designed for. One of the problems is that it lacks a mandatory authentication step. If you were, want a protocol for authentication, then it was not unreasonable to think that the protocol is going to require the user to authenticate. And OAuth2 does not require the user to authenticate every time. The other thing that's missing is the lack of feedback or assurance that authentication has taken place. So even if your OAuth2 provider has authenticated the user, the relying party has no knowledge of that taking place. It doesn't know whether it did or whether it didn't. So it can't make any assumptions about it. The lack of um, discovery or discovery protocol, as well as the, the woolly, the abstract standards, makes implementation relatively difficult because it does mean if you're writing a plugin or a library that you have to write code for every single provider simply because they're all different. And even in some very simple cases like pure authentication or a request just to get some basic user information, uh, none of that standardized and that makes the implementation difficult. This is uh, a similar issue. So the user data itself is not specified. So again, it leads to um, provide a specific code and that's um, a pain to implement. And because OAuth2 isn't an authentication protocol, it shouldn't be used for login, but that means it hasn't got any logout functionality. Now, we don't tend to think of log logging out too much, and I'm not going to talk about it any more uh, particularly. But one of the things that is useful with a federated authentication system is you want the ability to log out of all systems that are connected back to the identity provider. So even if I'm in the relying party, if I click log out, I actually want logout to log out on the identity provider as well as on the relying party. And OAuth2 doesn't have any concept of that um, as it wouldn't do. Um, and that can be a problem more so in some systems than others. But in most federations, people like the idea of a global sign out. So OpenID Connect. What's OpenID Connect? Well, it's not directly related to normal OpenID. So if you've heard of OpenID, OpenID Connect isn't just a new version of OpenID. What it is really is a subset of OpenID concepts that have been made to be compatible with OAuth2. So OpenID is used for authentication, but there are a whole load of protocols and everything else designed around that which are not required because that's already provided by OAuth2. But there are certain parts of it, like the ID token, like the signing and signature, like the discovery, that are all parts of the normal open ID. Some of them change slightly to fit in with OAuth2. In some ways, I think they should probably have given it a different name. Um, but there you go.
So this addresses all of the authentication shortcomings of OAuth 2. That was the whole purpose for it being created in the first place. The guys at OpenID have realized that OAuth 2 is popular. It's being misused for authentication. And so they've come up with OpenID Connect. And really, it comes down to this ID token. The main element added by OpenID Connect to OAuth 2 is this idea of an ID token. So the ID token is a JSON web token. It contains various signature elements and identifiers and kind of random stuff, as well as, at the minimum, a subject identifier, if you like a user ID. And it can potentially contain more information than that, depending on how exactly it's requested from the identity provider. But using this ID token and all of the things that come with it, we get the signature can help us verify that the, the data contained in it is true. And that allows us to have an assurance about the authentication that has taken place. So as well as the, the basic uh, signature elements, the basic subject identifier, if you set a certain scope on your initial O2 requests, then you can actually contain it, you can retrieve additional claims in the ID token like email and name and surname and things like that as well. So it's very useful as a, a very simple element that can return all of the information that you need without having to go to all of the complexity of OAuth 2. So like I say, it's based on the JSON web token. It includes things like authentication type. So I can tell the relying party that the user logged in with a password. So the relying party with that kind of information can make informed decisions about risk. So for instance, if I try and authenticate the user and it says they haven't authenticated for a day and I need them to do something important on my site, then I might re-request the login and I might say to the or identity provider, I need this person to log in. And when that data comes back, I know whether that's actually happened or not. And I have assurance for that. And again, depending on the uh, grant flow that you're using, the ID token will be returned with or instead of the authorization code. It is also returned depending on the flow from the access token endpoint. So it's sometimes returned with the access token. It can actually be returned from the API itself as well. So there's a number of places it can come back from. But again, we'll look at the different types of grants. So we're going to look at three different grants. Two of them are extensions of the two that we've already seen in OAuth 2. They're not massively different, although there's some stuff hidden under the covers, which uh, is a bit more involved in OAuth 2. There's then a third flow, which is a combination of the first two, which we'll look at in a minute. So the first one we're going to look at is the authorization code grant again. And in this flow, the relying party passes response type equals code to the identity provider just as per normal OAuth 2. So it will also have to pass a scope parameter as well. So we see this is the same. The, this, the difference in this line when it asks for permission is the fact that the scope will include OpenID. So the scope parameter in OAuth 2 is optional because it's not used for anything in OAuth 2 specifically. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. In OpenID Connect, scope is mandatory and it must include the value OpenID if you're using any of the OpenID Connect flows. And that's just to allow the identity provider to know whether you are an OpenID Connect client or just a pure OAuth 2 client. So the uh, user says they're happy to release the details. This is all the same. That says I'm the site authenticates. But this time here, we say, OK, now that I have validated your authentication credentials, you can now have an access token. But this time, because you've all, you've passed open ID, I'm also going to give you an ID token at the same time. So they're both going to come back in the same response, but they come back in different formats. So the, the normal token is just usually an alphanumeric string. The ID token is uh, an encoded JSON web token. So those will both come back. Uh, when the ID token comes back, as with all of the OpenID Connect flows, it needs to be validated. And that's done using uh, a signature, an X509 signature, just like 
uh, we use on lots of other software systems. And again, that can all be taken care of by a library if you have a good library. But you need to validate that because obviously the danger would be here that some of that data could be malformed and could provide uh, a non-assured um, authentication back to the user. Um, note that that signature stuff is not mandatory if you've obtained the token in this grant because at this stage, the relying party has called the identity provider directly. So it has assurance that that, um, that is safe and that is secure. If you get it back in the implicit grant, then you need to validate the signatures to make sure that it hasn't been changed in the URL. So again, this is uh, preferable, this, this grant as it was in OAuth 2, because the relying party can authenticate so the request mostly looks like a normal O2 request. The scope parameters additional, um, and there are a range of optional additional parameters specified by OpenID Connect. So you can hint to the server and say, I want you to authenticate the user in a strong way, or I want you to authenticate if they haven't authenticated since a day ago or, or whatever else. A whole load of stuff in the spec, which you're welcome to look at. But in terms of the, um, the basic flow, other than that, that's all the same. So that takes us to the implicit grant. Again, it's less secure because we don't have that secret, so we can't authenticate relying party to the identity provider. So when OAuth 2 would have provided an access token directly in the implicit grant, OpenID Connect returns an ID token as well as or instead of the access token. And that depends whether the response type in the request uh, is either ID token space token or just ID token by itself. And depending on which of those you pass in, will tell the identity provider, do I just want an ID token because I'm doing a quick authentication? Or do I want an ID token and a token because I want authentication and I want to access an API as well? If you just pass the value of token and you didn't pass ID token at all, then the identity provider would treat it just like uh, an OAuth2, normal, pure OAuth2 request, and you wouldn't get any ID token back. So in, generally, you're going to pass ID token if you're using this implicit grant. Yeah, as opposed to OAuth2, the request in OpenID Connect must contain uh, a nonce parameter, and that is to help prevent replay attacks. So there's another area where OpenID Connect have said, let's be more specific about this. Let's make these things secure. If a nonce is needed to be secure, let's make it required. And it just, you know, just makes everything work that much better and make it much more secure. So in this grant, there are a few additional checks to carry out in the flow. The same works carried out for the most part in the authorization code grant. So you're checking signatures. You have a lot more checking to do in the implicit grant because of the, um, the lack of a secure channel. And the other thing is because the communication in the implicit grant only occurs via URL, then the relying party also has to support the response in the ID token coming back in the URI fragment. That is the thing that comes after the hash or the pound symbol. And because no additional web service calls are made to get that token. So again, that's the same as normal. That's the same as normal. That's the same as normal. At this point, again, the difference is you will get one or two tokens depending on what your request type is and then once that's happened the rest of it's the same as before so again not not a massive departure it's just this id token that um, appears in a couple of different places so the hy hybrid flow as you might imagine is a basically a combination of the authorization code and the implicit grant so the three different combinations will determine whether you get an access token or an ID token or both um, or more than one um, access token. So if we pass in the value code space ID token as our response type, then what we get is we get two things back. We get an ID token back immediately which is great. We can use that to authenticate immediately. But then we get the deferred access token in the same way as the authorization code. So we get an authorization code back, which we have to swap to an access token, which we then can use to access an API. 
So why do we do that? Well, this gets us the high security access token because it requires the authentication part of the authorization code grant to take place. So that means that we get, we're get we going to get full access to the API. And the immediate ID token allows us to quickly authenticate uh, and carry on with that user, even if we carry out the other part asynchronously. Coded token means that I don't want an ID token, but I want an immediate access token and a deferred access token. Now, this is going to be unusual and probably not very commonly implemented, but because the immediate token by definition is less secure, then uh, it's possible that an identity provider or the resource provider is not going to provide you so much API access with that token. They're going to say, if you want full access to this API, I require that you authenticate. So by providing code and token, I get a token back straight away, which I can use straight away. Again, perhaps just to get something simple like a, a name and an email address. But then I can convert the other code into a token, which I can use to get more and more information. Again, I might want to do that asynchronously. Um, and the other thing is, if you say code, ID token and token, you get everything. You get an immediate ID token, an immediate access token, and a deferred access token. And bear in mind that if you use this last variation, you will get two ID tokens back. You'll get one from the access token endpoint and one from the initial redirect as well. Clearly, the data should be the same in both of them because it refers to the same user. But there are some fields that might be different in them, like timestamps and things. And it's possible that some fields that are not mandatory in the ID token that comes from the access token endpoint, they might not be present depending on the implementation. So the two ID tokens could be identical, but that's not guaranteed. But obviously the information in it, like email address and stuff, would all be the same. So then a couple of other things that OpenID Connect adds. Discovery. Um, although it's still possible to configure OpenID Connect manually, just like we have to do with OAuth 2, we have to look up the, the endpoints, we have to look up the parameter names and types, look up the data that's going to come back and all the rest of it. By adding discovery as an optional extension to OpenID Connect, then it allows us to avoid a lot of configuration. Because rather than typing in lots and lots of endpoints, we type a single endpoint, which is a discovery document, and we allow our system to go and read that discovery document. And from that, it's going to know what data is available, what claims are available, what all the endpoint URLs are, what the signing certificates are. So all of that stuff, which you'd have to do manually, discovery can allow you to do automatically. Because another thing we haven't really looked at, but something that has to take place is when you're checking signatures on the ID token, you need access to the certificates that you're going to use to verify those signatures. And when you ask the question of, well, what happens if the provider updates their certificates? Well, normally it would mean that the relying party would have to manually update their configuration. And that can be a bit of a pain. So what OpenID Connect allows you to do is specify those certificates in the discovery document. So when you update it, you can add a secondary certificate, which the other system will automatically use both certificates if one of them doesn't work. And then at a later date, after a day or a week or whenever it is, you can remove the primary and make the secondary one the primary one. So there's a whole load of stuff there that helps with that. Uh, really, like with all software, if you use a well-featured library, then this functionality should be in there for you. Um, and the example I want to give, just because I've seen it and I've used it, is Identity Server is uh, an open source project. It's for .NET, and it already supports all of these features. It supports OpenID Connect and OAuth 2. It provides the things like the logout functionality. It looks after all claims transformation. Uh, um, almost everything is hidden away, and just with a few lines of code, you can get all of this extra, extra assurance that OpenID Connect provides with no more code than it would take you to implement OAuth 2. So looking for a good library uh, is really important. Now, the data specification problem with OAuth 2 is solved by OpenID because it's nailed down some field names for common data. 
So if you're returning somebody's given name or family name, OpenID Connect says it has to be called given name and family name. So you're not going to call it surname or second name or last name or anything else. You're going to give it these specific names and it's just again going to make it much easier for plugin um, writers, plugin authors to write a standard plugin that's going to work for perhaps 75 to 90 percent of all use cases. It also defines more complex data like address. So address is a JSON object, which in itself has subfields like line one, line two, city, postcode, that kind of stuff. So again, they're all defined, which makes sure that all this data is going to come back correctly. Another thing they, they've done in OpenID Connect, again, which helps us a lot, is mapping of the scope types to the claims that come back in the response. This was something else that OAuth 2 didn't define. Uh, and when we did this at Pixelpin and we wanted to introduce the idea of scope, I ended up copying the scopes that were used by another company like Twitter or somebody just because there was no definitive set of scopes. So for instance, if you use the scope profile, OpenID Connect says that that maps onto 14 claims including names, pro their profile, their date of birth, and that kind of stuff. The, the scope email maps onto both the email and the email verified field, um, which tells the relying party whether the email was validated by the identity provider. Um, things like address and phone are also predefined scope. So again, it just makes it easier to make things that are standard and that work across lots of different clients. The other thing that you can do in OpenID is you can have a custom claims request. So if I only want a specific set of data, I could use one of the predefined scopes, but actually it might be easier for me to say, I just, I just want name, address, and telephone number. So again, using the claims parameter, OpenID Connect allows you to uh, customize that and to be very specific about what you want to return. If you're interested in those kind of things, you can look in the OpenID specification to get more information because there's, there are obviously lots of issues related to that. So there are um, issues related to claims that are not covered here on this slide, there, uh, which are fringe cases for most people. And there are also details in the spec that are relevant to people who are writing their own code from scratch, but which are not relevant for most of us who are just going to grab a library from somewhere and call into the library. So some next steps, just things that you might want to think about going forwards, you know, spend some more time watching some OpenID Connect videos. There are a couple doing the rounds, one by Dominic Bayer, um, who's very big in the kind of .NET identity world. He's one of the co-authors of uh, the identity server. So there's definitely one of his videos going around and I'm sure there'll be others, you know, by watching the videos again and again, some of the concepts will sink in a bit more easily. Um, spend some time, get out a sample project, you know, to create an MVC project, follow the OpenID Connect or the Identity Server examples and tutorials and have a little play, see how it works, have a look at what the URL's doing and, and where stuff's going and how it all glues together. Again, just a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of playing around with some code is going to hopefully work wonders for your understanding. Try and find a library that implements the OpenID Connect functionality. Even if your application isn't in a place to use it for some reason, if you can start working with that library sooner rather than later, it just makes your upgrade path uh, more easy to achieve. And it means that you can plug into an identity provider that already supports OpenID Connect, even if your site doesn't at the minute. So have a look around for that. Consider upgrade paths. So you've got applications, you might have direct login only, in which case I strongly recommend moving to a single sign-on solution like Pixel Pin, the one that I work on, or, you know, any of the others, Google, Facebook, whatever. Um, you know, I must say that they there are privacy issues with some of those choices, but, you know, it's definitely preferable to let somebody else worry about your authentication security than worrying about it yourself. So consider how you might get from where you are to having something based on OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. Something that's really important is, you know, how are you going to ensure that your co-developers, your, your team, your architects are familiar with these concepts? Because it still seems that most developers are not really very um, 
they don't understand very well the different security issues in development. And while that carries on, we're just at the risk of making more and more and more mistakes and causing more and more problems for people. So how are you going to be able to do a little session, a little presentation, a little video, whatever, to show your co-developers how these things work? And lastly, you know, share the words. One of the things I, I always talk about it with people, I drive them mad by talking about security. I kind of think that clearly developers are not taking the responsibility to learn all, all of this stuff by themselves. So the rest of us are going to have to keep going on and on about it until maybe one day these developers might finally wake up and say, Do you know what, this is important. I need to go out and find out about it. So thanks for watching the video. If you have any questions or comments, as always, please put them below. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you in my next video.